Hello and welcome back. Today I speak with John, who is a member of the Western Rite Orthodox Church, the Western Rite Orthodox Church. Today we'll be discussing, well, what is the Western Rite and why it's important to the Orthodox mission in America. But before we jump in there, I want to share with you a word of encouragement from a fellow viewer or listener who called into our voicemail box to leave the following. Hello, I was just uh, calling voicemail here just to let you know it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to uh, listen to your podcast and I just want to give you a word of encouragement to keep up the great work and uh, God bless. Thank you Eric for that word of encouragement. I really appreciate it. If you want to call in click the description. There's details there or you can do it in the description of the podcasts as well. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a question feel free to ask. Now to my conversation with John. So John, what is Western Rite? What's its function? What is it? How did it come about? Sure thing. So the Western Rite um, refers to the liturgical use of the church, specifically in the Western part of the Roman Empire. Um, we tend to focus <clears throat> on the large city of Rome because that was the main apostolic see in the West. So uh, its history traces back, according to Holy Tradition, to St. Peter the Apostle. However, that has been debated hotly by academics, like much of all of the claims of Holy Tradition. Um, so I, I won't make a value judgment on where the historicity of that claim lies, but that is what the Holy Tradition states. So how did, how did this, um, you know, we hear about Eastern Catholics who use the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the the mass or the liturgy of the western rite is not saint john chrysostom's liturgy uh so so where do we get that and how did how did this become a thing within orthodoxy a number of of people i would i would venture to guess uh, aren't even familiar with the western rite yeah that's right um the roman rite itself is one of the most conservative liturgical traditions in all of christianity the eastern rite specifically the byzantine rite that the orthodox church primarily uses is actually one of the most, um, ironically, it's one of the most changing traditions. Um, you see St. Mm. Justinian adding the, uh, the uh, I believe it was Only Begotten Son, the hymn of Justinian. No. Um, you have the Cherubic hymn added later on. Um, a lot of the ritual is changing to match the Byzantine court empire in Constantinople. Mm. So you see um, great hymn writers, um, Ephraim the Syrian and so many others are constantly adding new liturgical material to this rite. And that's not a bad thing whatsoever. That's a beautiful thing, a beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. Um, but that did not really happen in the West. We kind of just hmm. stuck with the same thing that we've always been doing. It's very bare bones in comparison to what's going on in Constantinople. So yeah, it's a very conservative liturgical tradition. And... Um, yeah, I think I'm ready to kind of delve into the history behind um, the modern Western right movement in the Orthodox Church, if if that's okay. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to to uh, to listen and, and hear what you have to say about that. But I do want to point out first that the only reason it's ironic that the the Eastern liturgy has added things, as opposed to what we would call a, a conservative, you know being the the western right mass is because uh, a number of people that are arguing against and we don't have to get into this yet but that argue against the western right it's because they think it's innovation when in actuality we can recognize that additions and sort of changes of a liturgical nature as they happen throughout the course of history is to a totally legitimate movement of the Holy Spirit for the purposes of a particular place or an em empire or or a local community. Um, but but that's not what happened with this this Western Rite Mass. So it's, it's ironic in that sense, and I just wanted to point that out. But please tell me about the uh, the liturgical um, sort of the, the renewal of this within orthodoxy today please yeah yeah I'll, I'll talk about the history of kind of the modern resurgence of the western right um it wasn't as so to kind of preface that i'm going to kind of talk about where the western right left off and then kind of pick it up mm. in modernity so people might surmise that okay if the west was doing the western right the the roman right before the schism 
And after 1054, what happened? Did it just disappear in orthodoxy? Um, that would be the logical um, thing to suppose. However, that's not necessarily the case. Many might be surprised to know that the Western Rite continued usage in the Orthodox Church, specifically on Mount Athos. Um, one of the, mm. the highest um, Athenite monasteries, uh, let me refer to my notes because I am not a, uh, a Greek expert here. The name is Amalfinon. Um, they were a Benedictine Roman Rite monastery on Mount Athos. And they continued, uh, they were not just a monastery, they were a ruling monastery. Um, and they were actually founded with the help of St. Athanasius of Mount Athos, who is a great saint of Athos. Um, the monastery closed after the Crusades attacked, the Crusaders attacked um, Mount Athos in 1287. And I, su I suppose that the reason why it closed was because there weren't that many trained Benedictine Orthodox monks laying around to um, rebuild things after... The Crusaders left it a smoldering ruin. So that's kind of where things ended on an official note, 1287 around there, um, not necessarily 1054. So the modern efforts began in 1716 when a group of non-juring Anglicans reached out to the patriarchs of Constantinople and Russia to inquire about joining communion with them and becoming Orthodox. Now you may ask, what is a non-juror? A non-juror is someone who refused to swear an oath to the uh, monarch of England. There was a succession dispute in England about who would take over the empire, and about 2% of the clergy in the Anglican church there in England refused to recognize the, um, the appointed monarch for whatever reason. And they were extremely traditional clergy, um, very Catholic in their liturgy, they weren't very Protestant like we think of Anglicans today. They used incense and chanting and ritual and all of that. Um, and yeah, they represented about 2% of the clergy. And talks continued with the two patriarchs until 1725. Um, they fell out because the Russian church was highly intrigued about um, creating an English Orthodox church. Um, However, it fell out because the Russian church requested several of its bishops, the non-juring bishops, to visit Russia to have in-person talks with them. And the issue was the non-juring bishops couldn't afford to travel to um, Moscow. So it was a financial issue, and the talks fell out because they just couldn't get there. Mm. Um, but yeah, so the entire event... Why I'm bringing this up, um, because no Western Rite parishes came out of this event, so why am I talking about this? The reason is um, the Eastern Patriarchs wrote a letter, an encyclical, back in reply to these non-juring bishops, and this letter was accepted at a pan-Orthodox level, meaning all the Eastern Patriarchs assented to it, which is something that happens pretty rarely. And there's a section that I would like to quote from that letter, and you'll see why this is relevant to modern Western Rite. The letter reads, And as for matters of custom and ecclesiastical order, and for the form and discipline of administering the sacraments, they will be easily settled when a they will be easily settled when once a union is effected. For it is evident from ecclesiastical history that there both have been and now are different customs and regulations in different places and churches. And yet, the unity of faith and doctrine is preserved the same. So, why I'm bringing this up is because it shows that the Eastern patriarchs at the time were clearly okay with using the Western Rite. They cite ecclesiastical history and are totally expecting that the form and discipline of administering the sacraments will look different for this English church. So, to me, I, I point this out because it shows that there's a willingness on the part of the Eastern patriarchs not to just strictly evangelize using the liturgy of John Chrysostom, but perhaps explore some um, older and um, more um, familiar traditions to these Western inquirers. Right, and we see this even uh, there being a distinction between like Byzantine liturgics and Russian liturgics and the way the music, you know, the music is, is um 
more palatable to the Russian, <laughs> to the Russian people, the way that they are doing it, and, and more, you know, traditionally uh, palatable to the Greeks with Byzantine chant. So while it's not the same uh, distinction between liturgies, it's uh, it is a custom that changed given the the locale. Absolutely. Um, so with that, the next milestone occurs in the 19th century. Um, in 1840, a well-known high church Anglican by the name of William Palmer, who, um, as a sidebar here, the if you turn to your Philokalia, which I believe was helped translated by Metropolitan Callistos of Blessed Memory, you'll notice it talks about William Palmer in there. That's actually, um, this is his grandfather who we're talking about here, so if that puts it into perspective. Um, mm. He was a high church Anglican, and he contacted St. Philaret of Moscow and a well-known Russian theologian, Alexis Komiakov, to inquire about using the Western Rite in England as an Orthodox Christian um, upon his conversion to the church. And he received a very favorable reply back. However, um, nothing came of that because um, you have to have a Holy Synod to back a liturgy. It's not just one particular bishop. So unfortunately, nothing came from that specifically. However, a few years later, in 1860, a man named Dr. Julian Joseph Overbeck um, inquired with the Russian church about establishing a local Orthodox church in the West that would um, use the Western Rite as her primary liturgy. Mm. And Overbeck went further than um, Palmer did because he not only went to the Russian Holy Synod to request this, he also went to the Synod in Constantinople to request it as well. Um, and both of these synods approved it. But Overbeck, kind of a little brief history about him as a figure because he is sort of the father of the modern Western Rite and uh, it wouldn't do any justice to talk about our history without talking a little bit about him. So he was a Lutheran who, uh, or sorry, he was a Roman Catholic priest, my bad, jumping ahead of myself. And he started to study the papacy and the history of the papacy, and he became thoroughly disillusioned and came to the conclusion mm -hmm. that the claims uh, that the Roman Catholic Church were making were not historically defensible from the church fathers. So he became a Lutheran because he lived in Germany, and that was about the only other option he had at the time. So he married to a he got married to a woman and served as a very high church Lutheran pastor. Eventually, um, the Oxford movement in England, which kind of spawned the Anglo-Catholics, where it was happening. You have figures like E.B. Pusey, John Henry Newman, and these figures in England. And he actually went to England to study under them. And he never actually joined the Anglican Church. But um, after his study there, he kind of saw the, the contradictions with the branch theory of ecclesiology that the Anglicans held to. And he got in contact with another figure named Vladimir Gate, who authored a book called The Papacy, which many people might be familiar with. Um, and they both uh, became Russian Orthodox at the Russian embassy there. In well, mm -hmm. Overbeck became in the became Orthodox at the embassy in London, and Gate at the embassy in Paris. Um, and Gate also worked to establish the Western Rite as well. So these are the two <clears throat> main figures in this um, time period that worked to get the holy synods of the church to bless the, the actual texts of the Western Rite liturgies again. So with that, um, 1869 is when the holy synod of the Russian church approved it, and 1882 was the year that the synod of Constantinople approved that. Um, so at this point... We have really no actual parishes being formed. It's all theoretical. It's all up in the mm -hmm. air. It's being discussed by theologians, by academics, um, and things like that. We start to see things sort of concretize here when we look at uh, 1890. Bishop Vladimir Sokolovsky, I hope I'm saying that right, of the Russian diocese in Alaska. He received a former old Catholic parish outside of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, into the Orthodox Church. And they retained the Western Rite, and they cited the um, Holy Synod of Moscow, actually, as their um, their evidence that it's approved by the church. So that was our first modern Western Rite church, was in 1890 um, here in America. Hmm. In 1898, the Holy Synod of the Russian Church um, established an entire Western Rite diocese in Moravia 
um, which would be in Czechoslovakia. Um, and in 1904, the famous illustrious St. Tikhon and Bishop St. Raphael of Brooklyn, with the help of St. John of Chicago, so several saints here, um, actually petitioned the Holy Synod of Russia to permit the um, an, a form of service that the Anglicans were doing for Holy Communion um, to be permitted as a use of the Western Rite with significant alter, alterations to the lit liturgy to make it conform to Orthodox belief and practice. And I have a, uh, a show on this on my channel um, called The Russian Observations on the American um, Book of Common Prayer. And you can check that mm -hmm. out. And I go through the actual document that these three um, saints helped produce. And I kind of walk through that in comparison to um, the current approved liturgy of St. Tikhon, which is just that Anglican derived liturgy that has been significantly retooled to fit Orthodox theology. So I kind of compare the notes that they had with the current liturgy, and you can see um, that we're following the guidance of all three of these saints, as well as the Holy mm -hmm. Synod of Russia. So is the the, the liturgy of St. Tikhon the current uh, mass that is used by the Western Rite? Great question. So the Western Rite, um, there'll be three main liturgies that are going to be used. Today in canonical orthodoxy, there are only two of them that are being used. And the first is the Mass of St. Gregory. And that's that ancient Roman rite that um, is existed from the first thousand years. Uh, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody today, I don't think, would even argue against that. There's no legitimate grounds to argue against it. The second one is the Liturgy of St. Tikhon, which is a retooled um, version of the what the Anglicans were doing around this time with significant alterations. And if we have more time today, I can talk more about that, or maybe in another show, I can talk more about the Liturgy sure. of St. Tikhon specifically, since it's more of a virtual thing. But um, mm. I'd be happy to look yeah. at that. It sounds like that could be its own its own episode altogether. Right, yeah. I only mentioned it just because it's, it's significant to the mission to the Anglicans here in America. But uh, yeah, I can totally talk sure. about that another, another time. But... Uh, yeah, so continuing forward, St. Tikhon, when he was here in New York City, he established a Western Rite Chapel in his cathedral here in New York, in the side altar, in the mm. left hand, uh, I believe it's the north northern um, side transept. He actually had a Russian priest trained in Latin to offer the Mass for American converts there at the cathedral. So uh, wow. our founding um, father, so to speak, St. Tikhon in the, in the American church here, was a, a strong supporter of the Western Rite and went to great lengths to train people to serve it for the converts. So that kind of shows where his heart mm. was at with that. Um, jumping back over to Europe, St. Gorazd Pavlik, he was consecrated to the Episcopacy in Serbia, and he was assigned to be the bishop of that diocese in Czechoslovakia. Um, due to pressure during the Nazi persecution, the diocese had to flip to the Eastern Rite. Um, and there's a, a, a touching story. I encourage everybody to please go read about St. Garazd and his um, stand up against the Nazi regime at the time. I won't get into it for the sake of time, but he was martyred mm -hmm. for the faith. And uh, he is the first mm -hmm. modern Western Rite saint here produced. So I just wanted to mention him. Um, fast forward again, 1926, an entire old Catholic jurisdiction in Poland was received into the Orthodox Church under Bishop Alexis Grodno. Unfortunately, the Nazis just really had it out for the Western Rite because the entire diocese was exterminated during the um, Holocaust, unfortunately. So on a different note, um, other than Nazi Germany, the, after the Russian Revolution happened with the rise of communism, large numbers of Russians, as I'm sure the audience is aware, fled to Paris in France. And in 1929, a confraternity or a brotherhood, a lay brotherhood was formed in Paris um, named the Confraternity of St. Irénée. And they were a Western Rite confraternity and they were chaired by none other than Vladimir Lossky himself, a prominent theologian. Um, they actually served their first Western Rite liturgy in 1929. Um, so jumping back across the pond to America, I mentioned St. Tikhon, St. Raphael, St. John of Chicago. Um, back to St. Raphael, he uh, appointed a bishop after he um, 
was finished with his ministry to, to secede him, um, named Bishop Aftemius. And you're probably familiar with Bishop Aftemius Ophiesh, um, kind of a, a sorrowful name in American orthodoxy. He kind of shattered everything when he got married and it caused the canonical chaos that we have today in American orthodoxy. Um, but American Western Rite orthodoxy does stem from um, Bishop Aftemios. In 1932, he consecrated a bishop named Ignatius, and Ignatius's ministry was to establish a non-geographic Western Rite diocese um, to serve American converts, particularly Catholic, Old Catholic, and Anglicans. To do, to do this, he um, had specific clergy that were trained in the Western Rite, and they formed a group called the Society of the Clerks Secular of St. Basil. Well, as I mentioned, a couple of years later, Bishop Aftimios would get married, and it would cause the absolute chaos that we have today. All of the different jurisdictions would come to America out of necessity because their parishes were writing to them here in America saying, hey, our bishop just went crazy. We need a bishop. So all these jurisdictions come here. And this Western Rite group kind of fell through the cracks because they didn't have a home country to write back to. There was no writing mm. to the Antiochians or to the Russians or to the Greeks. They didn't have anybody because they were just Americans. They didn't, there was no place for them. So unfortunately they fell through the cracks um, in terms of canonical protection. However, they did maintain the Orthodox faith. And we'll come back to this group. They didn't just disappear, they continued. Um, 1936, Moscow Patriarchate under, Moscow, under Metropolitan Sergius, who is a very controversial figure. Uh, I won't talk about his personhood today, but he issued an edict establishing canonical norms for practicing the Western Rite, um, specifically like what vestments to wear, how do you conduct a Western Rite ordination, how do Eastern Rite clergy interact with Western Rite clergy, what music is sung, how does the church look, Where, what is the place of iconography in the Western Rite churches. These kind of questions that are more outside of the liturgy itself, but are important to governing a healthy parish were settled here. And mm. uh, there was an entire, another group of an old Catholic, um, another old Catholic jurisdiction that joined the Russian church under a man named, uh, I'm going to butcher his name. It's like Winier. I'm not a very good French pronounce. Um, Get it for French pronunciation. No problem. <laughs> but yeah, he uh, established a, a Western Rite church in France, and they were actually under the care of uh, Saint. They became under the care of Saint John the Wonderworker when he was Archbishop in of Western Europe. Uh, do you have any questions so far before I continue? Talking? No, I think this is great. I think I think moving forward, people will will have questions um, specifically about um, the figures that you that you are uh, discussing here, uh, you know, Metropolitan Sergius and 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 um, Ftemius who got married. Uh, did I say that yeah, right? Ftemius, yeah. Um, because because there's an a uh, tendency if we don't like something to kind of attack the proponents of it if they make a, a human foible. Um, so, I mean, at some point we should talk about that, but it might again be, be something in the, the future. Right. Yeah. Um, so moving, moving forward, um, past Metropolitan Sergius and his edict here, um, I mentioned the society of, of St. Basil there, th this group of priests that were Western mm -hmm. right, that kind of fell through the cracks when all of this happened. Um, in 1953, so just like 20 years later, they were all still alive, basically. Um, once the Antiochian jurisdiction got established, um, once Antioch sent a bishop here, I, I, his name escapes mm -hmm. me. Maybe somebody can correct me in the comments, but they sent a bishop here to establish an Antiochian jurisdiction. And in 1953, the, the Antiochian archdiocese here in America received the Society of St. Basil back into canonical protection. However, they put them under a temporary pro probation period um, as an act of uh, making sure that they were committed to canonical orthodoxy again. In 1958, however, the Holy Synod of Antioch investigated everything, found that they were totally justified, approved the Western Rite liturgy, and regularized them into the archdiocese. They received a copy of Metropolitan Sergius's guidelines and they looked good to them, so they forwarded it to Metropolitan Anthony Bashir here in America 
and said, hey, use this as the guideline. Metropolitan Anthony took a look at the edict that Sergius had issued, made some corrections to it, but for the most part kept it intact, and he issued it as his own edict here in America. And in 1961, Metropolitan Anthony created the Western Rite Vicariate under the Antiochian Archdiocese. And that kind mm -hmm. of is where modern Antiochian Western Rite stems from, is from this created vicariate, which is a non-geographic diocese. Um, right. And I, I haven't discussed the history of Rocor Western Rite. I mean, I can do that at some point, another day, perhaps, or if anybody's interested. Sure, and to be... Yeah, to be clear for, for those listening um, presently, there in the Orthodox Church are two jurisdictions, and, and Antioch and Rokor, which have uh, Western Rite um, affiliates, I guess. Yeah, here in America, believe it or not, though, in, in Europe, there's actually, the church in Romania actually has um, Western Rite parishes. Okay, all right, fair enough. I did not know that. What are, is it, is it under Romania then? Yes, it's under the Metropolitan Joseph, the Exarch of Western Europe. They don't conduct, so they're bi-ritual parishes. They don't do full-time Western Rite. They mm -hmm. do both rites, but yes, they, they're on, they're in uh, in Europe. Wow, that's fascinating. So no, please, if you have if you have more, please go on. This is uh, it's a lot of information, but I think it's important because you're, we're seeing uh, an active. Uh, an active attempt at renewal from from a lot of saints that many yeah. people highly regard even yeah that's that's kind of the thread that i want to i want to draw out here um that kind of concludes my history section for today but just to point out point out what you were saying there um every saint that has come in contact with the western right it, they weren't indifferent to it they weren't against it they supported it even with their blood i mean saint mm -hmm. john the wonder worker devoted many years of his life to this, um, Saint Garaz gave his life, um, and he was a Western Rite um, bishop. So we see every saint that has had any contact with it has been extremely favorable and supportive of it. I just wanted to draw that out, and we even see great theologians that people are familiar with, such as Lossky mm -hmm. or um, Abbe Gate. Even they were doing the Western Rite as well. So it's not right. some foreign thing that um, some modernists have made up this is something that goes back and it's a part of our history and i mentioned eftimios because we all stem from from him basically here in yeah. america so even our claim as as western right we even go back to everybody else so um with everybody else as well so we're, we're not new this isn't something that was just created in 1950 mm. uh, our our lineage here the, the story is definitely about 300 years old and a lot of people don't know that yeah, and I think it's important to note that a lot of people confuse the difference between unity and uniformity. We don't have to have uniformity in order to have unity around the faith. You do not have to have the exact same fasting rules. We could talk about that in the Western Church. You don't have to have the exact same liturgy. It doesn't have to look the same the way you do the entrances. I mean, all of this even differs, um, can differ from person to person as far as fasting rules and the priest's pastoral advice. But even among, like mentioned earlier, the Russian and the Greek uh, diocese, and I think I think I would like to, to to point that out, but also to go from here and ask for you: Why do you think it's important? Why do you think the the renewal of Western Rite in America specifically is important? Yeah, that's an excellent question, um, and I think to understand to answer that question and understand why it's important, um, we need to understand its its mission. What is its stated mission? Because if you understand what it's here for. Um, I think it speaks to its importance, and you can also evaluate its success um, when, you, when you understand what it's here for. So according to our documents, according to the Western Rite Edict and Directory that I had just mentioned that Metropolitan Anthony Bashir, with the blessing of the Nod, had produced, um, it, it lists two main purposes. The first purpose, quote, to provide a home in the Orthodox Church for Western people of non-Byzantine cultural and religious background. So to this first point, we have numerous thriving parishes and growing missions. Um, there are now second generation Western Rite Cradle Orthodox. So um, 
I think that this has been successful. This purpose has mm. been successful. We have made a home for ourselves here. Um, we venerate many of the same saints that our Eastern Rite brothers do here in America um, because they helped us and they were our bishops as well. So I mm. think that, that that has been satisfied. Um, and as to the second purpose, it's to witness to the Catholicity of the Orthodox Church to her Byzantine Rite people, priests, and theologians. And this might sound... Um, controversial to say, but I think it's one of the biggest missions is actually to the Eastern Rite, because um, mm. I think it's so important that people in the Eastern Rite know that we exist and know that the Orthodox Church believes that we are the Catholic Church. Like, that is our belief. We don't believe that there are two churches or three churches. We are the Apostolic Church. When you look mm -hmm. at Pope St. Leo, when you read about what he did at Chalcedon, he wasn't a Roman Catholic who was just in communion with the Orthodox Church at the time. He was Orthodox, and mm -hmm. uh, we have to witness to our Catholicity and show that um, that those are our saints. When I look at St. Leo, I don't look at him as a Roman Catholic. I look at him as mm -hmm. doing the same thing that I do. He did the Western Rite Liturgy. That's mm -hmm. what I do. I'm Orthodox. What, what do you make of the tendency maybe a modern tendency to overemphasize the saints from the East over and against the West. Yes. Schism. Yes. Uh, St. John, to go back to him, he's my patron and uh, I just love him, but he uh, had a great love for the Western saints. And even in the Eastern Rite churches that he ministered to and pastorally led, he would constantly encourage them to celebrate the Western saints. And mm. I believe it was him who said that, um, we're going to have to remember our saints. And if we're going to evangelize the West, we have to venerate our own saints again. We can't do this without, you can't import, um, not that they aren't saints, but that doesn't speak to people the same way as this is my ancestor. And he was Orthodox. That means something to you yeah. more than, um, this was a holy man who lived say in far away. It speaks yeah. to you on a different level. And I think that that's absolutely right. And the Western Rite is a great way to speak to that as well. Because not only are you just venerating their icon, when you go to a Western Rite service, you are participating in the spiritual life that informed them and that sanctified them. And I think that that's a whole different level of veneration mm. as well. Yeah, and to, to jump off from that point, when I recall when my family went, I, I took my family to Ireland uh, my wife and kids a couple of years back and it was an extremely powerful experience i uh so I, my heritage is is irish um and before that scottish but but more immediately irish and walking onto the land there and seeing some of the the places like um glendalock monastery where saint kevin was was palpably I felt palpably connected to the faith in a way that the the East, when I converted over a decade ago, seemed completely foreign to me. And at the time, I liked the foreign because I was disgruntled with my Protestant upbringing. Um, and and I, I think a lot of our our tendency as as converts is to to react against something that we hate and look for something that is is novel to us and that can be importing these russian traditions or these greek traditions but that's that's a conversation for another time uh, it's amazing to me the exactly what you're saying how your heritage how it connects you to the faith in a way that otherwise feels like you have to to uh, posture some someone else's culture and I don't know, it was just very powerful having gone to Ireland and seeing, uh, going to Downpatrick, uh, seeing a place where um, St. Patrick was buried for a time. And uh, it was just, uh, it, was pow it was a powerful, powerful thing. And I think it's also a mistake to be anti-Western as an Orthodox Christian. It's easy for us to, you know be disgruntled with our, our previous tradition and want something new. And, and I, I think a lot of that does bring people into orthodoxy because it's so, it's a culture they've never experienced before when they walk into an Easter ch Eastern church. But to, to try to become orthodox 
as a way of refuting your heritage, I think is is a mistake. Agreed. And and something I'd like to to pose to the audience here, something that you just said that many people convert because they want to escape their Western heritage and they feel uncomfortable with that. And sure, you know, that might fill a parish or two in a, in a large uh, metropolitan city. But think about this. How many people are you not converting hmm. when you do that? How many people aren't going to come to church because it's just a big um, hate group about specific yeah. Western saints? That's yeah. not going to be attractive to somebody who really values those saints and who really values that liturgical heritage. So um, while you may be, you may find some success with people trying to run away from their, their, uh, their heritage in that regard. How many people are you turning away? I, I don't have an answer for that. It's a, just a rhetorical question to think about that. Um, maybe our approach isn't always the best approach, and maybe mm -hmm. uh, a multiplicity of approaches are needed to effectively evangelize a large group of people. I would agree with that. I think it's very off-putting to have one's orthodoxy be defined by opposition. We're not looking for orthodoxy as opposition. We're looking for it for truth and transformation. So to take something and attempt to wield it against, and this is this is something that I struggled with early on. I, I still do to a certain extent because it feels good to be right or feel like you're right. It feels good to uh, be able to you know, lord something over someone like that. But that's not of Christ, and it's not ultimately what we want in the church. What we want is transformation. And to a certain extent, transformation looks different for everyone in the sense that each saint has its own peculiar peculiarities. And the road that we get to that sanctification, like, look at the fools for Christ. <laughs> like, Absolutely. It, 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 uh, it can vary. And I think that the, the least... Mm, the least troubling of these variances should be different liturgical rites. Yeah, I agree. Um, there was a beautiful passage that I read from a Anglican monastic um, named Dom Gregory Dix, and he uh, wrote an interesting book called The Study of the Liturgy, which uh, I won't get into, but in that book he mentions how when... St. Augustine of Canterbury, who was sent by Pope St. Gregory the Great to evangelize the Anglo-Saxon people in England, when he landed on the shores and he said his first Mass, asking God to grant conversion to Orthodoxy to these people, those same words that, that he said during that liturgy are the same words that we say today in the Western Rite Liturgy. And mm. sometimes when I'm, when, I'm at, when I'm serving at the altar and I, I hear those words of consecration, the, the anaphora, the Roman canon, it kind of washes over me like these are the same words that were prayed in anticipation of my people becoming orthodox mm -hmm. and to me that's very powerful to me that um here we are we're still mm -hmm. we're orthodox and we're saying these same words yeah. and they were given to us and we received them and now we give them back to god wow that is beautiful and i think it's important here to point out too i don't know the 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 level of many of my listeners as far as is if you're just being introduced to orthodoxy or not but whether you're western right and you do uh, this western mass or you do the eastern uh, saint john chrysostom liturgy we're in communion so Absolutely. i i could go to a western right parish and commune or well, john could come to an eastern an eastern liturgy and commune there there's a, a important um point to be made with that yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, we are canonically Orthodox. We are under the the same structures as all of the other Orthodox here. Um, the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America boasts a Western Rite Vicariate, which is like a, a non-geographical diocese um, mm -hmm. that's oversaw by Bishop John of Worcester in New England. And you have in Rocor here in America, they also maintain Western Rite communities under um, their Stavropegial at this time, which means they're mm -hmm. directly under the ruling hierarch, which would be Metropolitan Nicholas of New York. So yeah, um, we wow. are in full communion, and I regularly attend Eastern Rite churches, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's no issue at all. So what, there there are not, how many, do you know how many parishes there are in the Antiochian Western Rite? So last I checked, um, parish, so 
I'll caveat this by saying mission chapels and missions aren't listed on their website. Okay. Because they only list full parishes for some reason. I'm not sure why. But hmm. there's about 35 to 40 when you factor okay. in the mission chapels and things like that. Okay. So so how if, – if someone is interested – because at this point we have, uh, you know, we have Eastern Eastern Rite churches, the Greek Orthodox Serbian OCA, Rokor, whatever, all over the place, and and we still don't have enough. I mean, there's an argument. To, that's a whole another conversation as well. But but if someone is is listening to this as an Anglican, and there's not a Western a Western Rite, but that that appeals to them. Let's say they they become Orthodox, and ten years down the line, five years down the line, they they think, how can we how can we get this going? What what are the steps for that? Absolutely, that's an, a wonderful question because I'm actually in that process myself of uh, uh, running a, a Western Rite chapel, getting one started, in the hopes of forming a canonical mission. So yeah, I would say to them, the first thing that you should do, of course, this is going to sound stereotypical, but pray. You want to ask God's blessing. And second, you want to reach out to the um, the vicariate. Um, the Antiochian vicariate would be a, a great... That's the model I'm going to pr- plug here because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm under the Antiochian vicariate. However, I actually um, I actually was received in Rokor Western Rite. So I've, I've oh, okay. served um, in, in both capacities. Um, but yeah, so I would recommend reaching out to the Antiochian Western Rite vicariate and speaking with them. And they will get you set up with the Antiochian Missions Department, and you can um, hmm. can begin conducting reader services, doing vespers regularly, uh, maybe have some priests come visit and catechize you. And hopefully, sure. if, if people show up and uh, you can get things going, you might be able to start a mission. So as, as someone that uh, attended a uh, Eastern Orthodox seminary, how, how do priests get trained in the Western Rite? How do potential priests, how, how does that happen? Sure. So in before uh, recently, they were just, they would attend the same seminary classes that you would. Um, you mm. you might have, you might have sat next to one and not even known it. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, they would go to St. Vladimir Seminary. They actually maintained a Western Rite chapel in, the, in one of the oh, basements okay. wow. down there. And that was oversaw by an Antiochian Western Rite priest, the former vicar general, um, Father Edward Hughes. That, to my knowledge, has that partnership has kind of ended because the Antiochian House of Studies received accreditation this past mm. year. Wonderful. And they now um, do a Western Rite concentration program. Um, so, yeah, they teach you Western liturgics and you're, you're wow. spiritually formed much in the same way that I'm sure you were formed in the Eastern Rite Fathers, primarily. Um, in the Western Rite concentration, you're you're formed in the Western Fathers, the Latin Fathers of the Orthodox Church, and you receive Latin Rite training as well. Wow, that is that's amazing. If if so, if if someone's interested in doing more research, they can of course uh, subscribe to your YouTube channel. I know we want to sit down. John and I would like to sit down and. You know, if you have questions, you can actually call in, believe it or not, if you're listening on, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you are. Uh, or if you're watching the YouTube video, you can you can go find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, linked in the description. You can leave a message. You can leave a phone message if you have a question. I'm sure John uh, would be interested in entertaining those. And John and I are going to, uh, the plan is at some point in the future talk more about this specifically about kind of a controversy which is happening happening around western right um in in western right in europe and some things going on there but if they want to learn more uh where where do we where do they find you yeah so uh we run an instagram channel rarate chaley you can find us over there um the youtube channel we have a an email on our, our YouTube channel um, mm-hmm. in the about section where you can contact us there. Um, we also have a, a discord server. If people would like to join that to discuss maybe a l- over a little bit more of a prolonged dis- discussion than just like sure. one question um, or we can voice chat through there as well. So all of those means work and to, to get a hold of me and I will be sure to provide those links to you as well. It's the link in the description. Great. Yeah, so, we'll put yeah. all that in the right down there um, in the YouTube description and I will put it also in the podcast description as well. So you'll be fairly well linked up. 
Uh, John, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you for joining me. I have one last question for you. Sure thing. What does Rorate Chele mean? <laughs> Oh, excellent question. So Rorate Chaley, uh, in the liturgy, I'm not going to get into the very the nitty-gritty, but we have a part of the liturgy called the introit, which means the entrance. It's the very first thing that the priest says during the Mass. And we have a beautiful Mass, specific liturgy, um, called the Rorate Mass, which means, uh, drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. It's mm. done just before Christmas. So I, I find that to be a very beautiful liturgy and it's it's done by candlelight and it's a cappella and it's just beautiful so mm. wonderful thank you for that and i look forward to speaking with you hopefully soon god willing as always thank you for listening if you appreciate the work that we're doing here with this podcast or the youtube please consider joining as a member on patreon or on youtube your support means a lot and if you're seeing this that means you made it to the end want to express my special gratitude for you watching all the way through we're listening all the way through.